regular meeting number nine of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. It is Monday, June fourteenth. Could we have the roll call by the town clerk, please? Chair Swift Payada. Here. Councillor Guvenali. Here. Councillor Jordan. Here. Councillor Lennon. Here. Councillor Sherman. Here. Councillor Sullivan. Here. Councillor Wall. Here. Thank you. Please join me in the pledge. the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Town Council reports and correspondence. Do we have any reports? Yes, Councilor Sullivan. Um, yes, I'd like to... Um, uh, report that the Open Space Management Committee and Green Belt Management Committee met on Tuesday the 8th of June and we are holding a public forum here on Wednesday evening June 16th for public input to initiate discussion on the Open Space Management Plan which is beginning its development so I hope that everybody will attend. It will be televised. Here, It's here at 7 p.m. Um, and again, it will be on the uh, cable access TV, TV, but we're looking for all kinds of input from everyone, so I please hope everybody can make, make the uh, effort to, to be here. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, the Municipal Operations Review Committee is meeting again this coming Thursday <coughs> at 7 a.m. Yes, a.m. Uh, because at least one member of the committee yours truly didn't want to have another evening meeting. So it uh, sounded like a good idea at the time, but all are welcome to attend. I also just wanted to report briefly that the Cape Elizabeth High School boys tennis team took the state championship uh, at Colby College last Saturday. And uh, a really neat thing, which I had never experienced before, uh, my son was on the team. Uh, so I was driving back behind the bus, and the, whole, the team was greeted by the Cape Elizabeth Fire and Rescue Departments. Uh, with a, a true victory parade down Route 77 to the high school. And that is a really neat thing about this town, how they welcome back their teams when they have a, 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 a victory like that. So I, I just wanted to extend my thanks to the fire and rescue departments for uh, doing that for the kids. That's great. Any? Uh, yes, I would like to um, let people know that on uh, June 26th, there will be the second annual Strawberry Festival, which is uh, sponsored by the uh, Cape Farm Alliance and many other businesses across town. And uh, the festival itself is held um, at Maxwell Strawberry Fields on Two Lights Road, and that's from 9 to 3. And then that evening, there'll be music and a silent auction and a potluck at the uh, Strawberry Field, so it should be a wonderful event for everybody here in the community. Um, you can find out more about it by going to kickelizabethfarms.com, and uh, we hope to make this a, uh, an ongoing event. And I'd also like to congratulate all the graduates of the class of 2010. I attended the graduation, and I have to say it's just wonderful each time I go to a graduation. It's such a wonderful community event. So good luck as you forge ahead into the world. Thank you, Penny. Any other reports? I'm over here. Here? I'd just like to second what Penny said about graduation. I went to, and it was really <coughs> impressive heartwarming event. Um, all the speakers were eloquent and funny and the graduates were impressive and um, the place looked beautiful and it made me very proud to be a citizen of this town. So congratulations to the whole graduating class and to the whole school for putting on such a great display of community spirit. And I better go on record because my daughter was in this class so and she, if she watches and hears all of these accolades and I didn't say anything, <laughs> I guarantee you that she'll have a conversation with me later. But uh, again, it was a very, uh, very uh, appropriate event. Uh, we were very pleased that the weather held out and uh, we had fog and we had uh, lots of, uh, you know, we had music and one of them was uh, the music Sail Away by four students that, who sang to the group and in the background we had 
all of the bells and whistles and horns from all of the traffic in the harbor. So it was all very appropriate and it was all planned from what I gather. So that, so that, the, I'm only kidding. <laughs> Just, but it was a great event. Really? <laughs> Anything else? Right. Um, I just wanted to uh, thank people uh, for uh, everyone who attended the parade, the Memorial Day parade, that w and all the various town officials, and especially the veterans who marched and the veterans who served. Um, at, uh, and we were very honored to celebrate them at the parade. Uh, on Memorial Day, and Jim Hubner, and who else should I be thanking? Who else should I be thanking? Yeah, Deborah. Deborah, sorry, Deborah. Um, our great motivating forces uh, for that parade. It's a wonderful event, and it's another sort of event that makes uh, Cape Elizabeth, makes us proud to live in Cape Elizabeth. And then lastly, the exercise of uh, democracy. We had an election, as everybody probably knows, and I wanted to just thank Deborah Lane and her various election workers um, on behalf of the council and the citizens, because it was a very, very busy day, and uh, they overcame some, some hurdles and uh, some challenges, and um, everything went relatively smoothly. So thank you very much. Okay, uh, next is an opportunity for citizens to discuss items not on the agenda. So if there's anyone here who would like to discuss something that's not on the agenda, if they could please come forward to the podium and identify themselves. No one's coming forward, so I think we'll move on to the town manager's report. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Swiftcatter. I, I, I just want to echo and amplify a little bit what you said about Deborah Lane and uh, her coordination of the election. Uh, you know, I think you just need to look at the next item on the agenda. We're reviewing minutes of the council meeting held May 10th, 13th, 24th, and 25th. We already mentioned Deborah had an integral part in the, the helping to plan the Memorial Day activity festivities. Uh, there was absentee voting that went on for a little over a month. There was, there was not only the, the primary vote, but there were sort of issues with uh, moving forward with the Fort Williams vote, the school budget validation vote, the continuation of the school validation, validation vote. Uh, and she also, when she was doing all that, uh, it was also the period of time when all the 30-day notices had to go out on tax liens, uh, of which uh, you know, there were quite a few of those. So I, you know, a lot of people contributed to the elections, a lot of the other departments helped. Uh, you know, I see a few individuals in the audience who helped with the election. Uh, but you know, I want to particularly note Deborah's leadership in not only with the election, but so many different activities in the last month. Uh, it's pretty amazing to uh, carry all that out in such a brief period of time and, uh, so effectively. So, thank you. Okay. Okay, next we have minutes of four different meetings. Why don't we take them one at a time and that way if anybody has any changes or um, corrections, we can deal with them one at a time. Do I have a motion with regard to the minutes of the meeting held May 10th? A move to approve the minutes of May 10, 2010. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Is there any discussion or corrections or changes? I just had one thing uh, that I noticed this afternoon on page four, item items 60, 61, 62, and 63, somehow lost their headings, and so I just thought perhaps we could the. The, uh, the heading that comes right next to the number of the item. So if those could be inserted back as they were for the, uh, for the agenda, that would be helpful. So um, I would just move to amend those if that's okay with that, that's fine. two of you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. So all in favor of those? It's unanimous. Okay. How about a motion for May 13th? I move we approve the minutes from May 13th. Is there a second? Second. Any uh, suggestions for changes or discussion? Okay, all in favor? It's unanimous. How about for May 24th? There. I move we approve the minutes from May 24th. Is there a second? Second. 
moved and seconded. Is there discussion or changes? So hearing none, all in favor? Okay, it's unanimous. And lastly, May 25th. There. Will we approve the minutes from May 25th? Is there a second? Then moved and seconded. Is there any discussion or are there any changes? <coughs> Hearing none, all in favor? It's unanimous. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Moving on. Item number 85 has to do with the Good Tables Annual License Malt, Vinus, and spiritu Spirituous. I always kill that word. License for the Good Table. Is there anyone from the public who would like to speak on this? Okay. Then do I hear a motion? Or do, is there any introduction that's necessary? Anybody feel a need for an introduction? No? Okay. Is there a motion? Should I move that we approve the malt, venice, and spirituous license for the Good Table Restaurant? A second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? I have one question. I assume there, this has been run by the police and fire chief. Votes, <laughs> officer, and no, uh, no, concerns. no questions or concerns. And Mr. Kostopoulos is here if anybody should have any questions of him as well. Okay. Um, let's move the question. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Um, item number 86 has to do with the Shore Road Pathway Grant application. Michael, did you want to make any introduction to this? Just very briefly, uh, the town planner uh, was gracious enough to help prepare this grant application. Uh, this is continuing the process of planning the Shore Road Pathway. Uh, the town council earlier authorized uh, an application to PACS through their biennial planning program. Uh, this one is, is one that goes directly to the state uh, for a particular program uh, at MDOT. Uh, that, that helps fund things uh, such as pathways. Uh, Maureen is uh, gracious enough to be here on a her vacation uh, to uh, answer any questions that you may have. Are there any questions? Yes, David. I was just wondering if, Maureen, you could address the issue of the sidewalk from the L.P. Murray construction property to the town center and, and how that might impact this? Yes, um, thank you, and I'm sorry to have to give you a separate option on this, but the grant application you have before you is for exactly what the council approved the last time you voted on the Shore Road path. Um, when the town was preparing the path application, we had the opportunity to meet with Dan Stewart, who administers this MDOT program, and he pointed out that he thought the uh, grant application would be slightly weakened by the fact that there is actually a gap in connectivity. Uh, if the path was built, you would be able to get from Fort Williams all the way down to Dr. Johnson's office, and then there's an existing sidewalk in front of Dr. Johnson's office, and that connects up to the western edge of the L.P. Murray property, and then there is no sidewalk from the, edge, the western edge of the L.P. Murray property to the intersection with, short, with Route 77. And so that, that small gap uh, from the L.P. Murray property to the intersection, he felt it could, be, uh, it could weaken the grant application. Uh, he's a busy guy. I was able to speak to him again uh, last week, and he did a draft review of this application. He pointed out that the map is at such a scale that he didn't really see it would be a big problem. So. If you don't want to expand this application to cover that section of sidewalk, you certainly don't have to do that. When you say it's not a big problem, you're saying the weakness is not a big problem? He didn't see it as much of a weakness anymore. Huh. David. Just in terms, though, from a planning perspective, uh, the folks that have been uh, supporting this project and, and as well as town staff, I mean, what is your view on whether we ought to consider trying to make sure that this connects, actually connects to the town center. That, that section that we're talking about was, it was one of the sections that was identified in the original town center plan as a place where sidewalks should be. Um, it's definitely a section that you would need if you want to have uh, that through connectivity all the way to the schools. If you don't get that section in there, 
you're really asking kids to come down the driveway for Dr. Johnson's, which is a public right-of-way, and then they could walk through the parking lot here and cross in front of the high school. So definitely if you're, if you're a proponent of connectivity, if you're a proponent of alternative modes of transportation, you should have that section as well. In some ways, wouldn't that alternatively be better in that we're not dumping traffic right into what is a suboptimal intersection anyway? Well, We've got a crosswalk over here anyway, and it would seem to me mm -hmm. make it less complicated even if it appears to be roundabout. If you're a parent, you might like this better. Uh, from a tra transportation planning perspective, you're sending people through uh, a parking lot, which is, from a transportation planning perspective, not a safe place for a pedestrian unless you've got a designated place for them to walk. So that's really the, the, the weak, <coughs> weakness here. David has some yeah. questions. I, I'm just wondering, in terms of the additional costs, potential additional costs of the town, you estimated that to be about $8,000, and I'm just, maybe this is a question for the town manager. Uh, do, we, do we have bonded funds remaining for this type of project? We, we also, yes, we do. We also have money in the sidewalk account, and in addition to that, the, the original bond when it was borrowed was specifically for town center sidewalks. Right. So it's, it's totally in keeping with the original intent of the bond. Okay. okay. Any more follow-up? Uh, no, not on that issue. Okay. Sarah? Just so I can envision it, where, if we chose the sidewalk that went directly, continued the sidewalk, where would it actually go? There's um, such a tight space in there. We've actually already had it designed. Uh, when, and the manager can probably speak to this better than I can, but uh, when the bond issue was passed, um, we had our engineering firm look at designing that sidewalk, and I, was, I actually called them and they went back to their old numbers to come up with the cost estimate for how much that would cost. But if you can imagine the south side of Shore Road where the L.P. Murray property is, imagine the side of their property closest to the intersection, you would just extend the sidewalk from that point there would be room for a four to five foot wide grass strip along that whole length, but it would go past shore things. It would go to the frontage of the key bank, and it would probably run right in front of the existing uh, split rail fence in front of key bank. And it would go around the corner to where the crosswalk is right now. So would it take out those plantings in front of key bank, or would it take out a portion of the shoulder in the road? There's a, there's a grassed shoulder, there's a grassed area now, and there's room for a sidewalk in that grassed area. I can't tell you whether we'd have to move the daylilies or not. Can I ask one more question? Sure. If we went with sort of Frank's concept, where instead of coming through that kind of hard turn off a of shore, is there a legal way to go through the key bank um, parking lot that seems to be not very heavily used if you designated it as the sidewalk. So you'd cut, mm -hmm. you'd essentially get past shore things and go back behind Key Bank and it would drop you at the, at the pedestrian crosswalk. If I might, I'd like to echo uh, again the popular word for tonight, the concern with putting people through parking lots. We have folks that drive this parking lot to the recycling bins at 35 miles an hour. Uh, and that come through this way to try to avoid that traffic light. It's, particularly with the key bank lot, it's the tightness around there with the drive through It's not somewhere where you want to send pedestrians through. Uh, they're, they're designed for motor vehicles and they should be on, they should be on sidewalks. Regardless of whatever happens with the shorter pathway in the, in the town center, the, you know, the long-term plan is, is, has always been to have those sidewalks. And it's due. This gets real sketchy sending them, particularly this parking lot. Uh, I think most of the town hall employees could tell you they are extremely nervous. Not this one, but the key bank. This one here. And the, the key bank has all the same issues because it's such a, a narrow, uh, you know, the sight distance around those turns through the drive through is very little. They just get nervous people going right on Shore Road. They cut that corner. I mean, that strikes me as scary. It's such a sharp line of corner. Yeah, there's, there's space there for uh, the, the other downside of the going through the parking lot at Key Bank is that's not public right of way. So we would have to purchase legal rights to get through there, and there goes your budget. More questions? David. Uh, I mean, it seems to me to make sense to apply for the additional funds to, to make sure we have actual linkage, but. Uh, 
if so, if, if so, if you apply for more money, will that make the application weaker? No, I, I had a, I, like I said, I had a couple of conversations with um, Dan Stewart, and it described to him this option. He didn't have a concern either way. I explained to him what we were looking at in terms of money. He he didn't hiccup or anything, so um, it doesn't drive it into a range where they wouldn't consider it. Uh, if if this is something the council wants someday. Uh, and you're successful with your grant application, you've found a way to fund 80% of it. More questions? I, I have a okay. couple. Um, I'm going to kind of go back to my comments when we talked about grant applications a while back in that we're basically putting out a a grant application without having the matching funds and for uh, we're asking MDOT for 669,000 which is part in order to do design right actually the 669,000 is almost pure construction money because the council has already authorized money which is which is being spent to do the final design so it's some of its contingency and some of it, but it's almost pure, cons pure construction money. Uh, I did uh, speak to Dan Stewart about our matching funds because I have to make some adjustments to the way I've presented it in the application. Uh, but he wanted it to be made clear that the matching funds need to be available by October 2011. And uh, I stated that the grant application would include a letter from our private partner and he suggested that they needed to commit to having that money available then. It was very, very normal for people to apply for money and not have the match in hand. You have to make the commitment to have it in hand. Mm -hmm. um, and he was very comfortable. He said we didn't even have to put the letter in, in, in the application. But I, I had asked SAFE to make that letter available because I thought the council would like to see it. Okay, then I'm going to ask for clarification from my peers. To refresh my memory on when we voted for the $110,000 for additional design, I did not understand that the vote was to move forward 100% with pathway, that what we were doing, what was voted on was we will forge ahead with design gain more of an understanding of what the full implications would be, and then we were going to have a continued dialogue or vote on whether the pathway would actually be done. Can somebody explain to me what we voted on? I see Michael's going to the news arc. <laughs> David? Oh, I'm sorry. My understanding is we approved the project. And we left open the possibility of doing this in phases, but we, we approved the entire project. And we okay. did it with the understanding that it would be a private slash public partnership with the only tax dollars from Cape Elizabeth for the design and permitting work. And then the rest would be funded through grants plus the private piece. That was my understanding. Sarah? My understanding of the 110000 was not for further design work. I thought we had designed the entire thing um, and that the 110 was for permitting to get us set up to apply for grants, i.e. engineering stuff and all the, to line all the ducks in a row so then we could then give Maureen our blessing to go out and actually seek out grants. So it wasn't, am I correct? It wasn't more design work actually. It was, was permit. Man, this is like that it's, movie, Russia. If you think of the word design in terms of planning, you are correct. If you think of the word design in terms of an engineer figuring out exactly what the slope has to be at a particular point on the project, then that's what you voted for the last time you voted. You voted for final design and permitting. I had a, if I could weigh in, I had a citizen call me um, on a related question a few days ago and my memory was lapsing, so I went back and looked at what we actually passed. And um, as I recall, we, we broke the question out into different segments, and we approved the Shore Road Pathway concept 
first. We said it would, it, it was, the, we the council, I don't mean it was unanimous every time, but the council approved uh, that it could be a phased construction and that it was the uh, $110,000 came from various sources. Some of it was the uh, bond money from the town center. And that was for further design work, as Maureen says, more like the detailed design of how to actually, that had to be done sort of in conjunction with getting <coughs> permitting done so that you could apply for the permits. So it was that kind of design work. It wasn't the concept design work. Um, so it was for design work, permitting, and I'm forgetting there was one other word, but it will, if you include planning board review, planning board review, but, and it's and it's on the planning board agenda for the meeting that's going to be in here tomorrow night. So I hope that doesn't add to the confusion. Okay. More questions? Yes. I, just, I have, yes. Thank you. I have a question. Um, if uh, the um, the grant is approved this evening, and uh, things go forward and in October 2011 if for the matching funds are not available what happens my understanding is and I don't know when they the grants are due July 1st and I, I apologize I don't know when they would announce who gets money um, but at the point that they they offer you the money then we come back again and you decide whether to accept the grant so the only thing you're being asked to do tonight is to authorize staff to submit the paperwork. Okay. So there's, you're not making, there's no, if, if they can't come up with the money, there's another step where you can say no thank you. So potentially we, this decision then, or, or let's just say money's available to begin anything, would not be happening before October 2011? Is that that's when they said that's when the money would be available and, and you know that's when you really need to have your cash match available is October 2011. So you have plenty of time if you know if this grant competes well and it gets funded then you would have an opportunity to vote to accept the grant funds that they offer and that would be another checkpoint to see whether or not the match is available. Oh, so that would happen before the October then, 2011. It Presumably, might happen by October 2011, but it definitely has to happen before anything else happens. Okay. And, Is that and, fair, Michael? And um, that's why we talked about doing it in a phased way, because if the money couldn't be raised or if the whole grant didn't come through, we didn't know at that point what, how much grant money might even, might even be available. So if we got a little bit of money, we might do a segment of it and do a segment, a segment, a segment over the years coming. So, but what I'm understanding you to say that October 11th is when the money is going to be available. So it's certainly there wouldn't be any construction before then, for sure, because there wouldn't October be October 2011. And, and then let, I don't know if you would be able to spend it then or whether you might go out to bid in February so you wouldn't be looking at anything until 2012. So. Okay. Okay. We already did apply for another grant. This is just yes. in yes. reference to this grant. Yes. I'm sorry. What did Mike say? I didn't hear that. We, we had already applied for another grant that the council authorized through PET. So the timing Maureen is speaking of just has to do with this grant. This okay. is a right. different grant. This right. is a, a second grant. I don't know where we're, we're applying for everything. That's what I figured. <laughs> okay. That's good. Yeah. That's good. The more, the merrier. Sarah. I just have a quick question. If we approve the sidewalk, are we saying that that we would tack on that money we need to this grant application or would we take it out of the bond that was specifically bonded for sidewalks? If, if what, like what I was looking at is if you look at the grant application, I've got a number in here, 669. What I would need for, for the council to do would be authorize me to increase that by up to $40,000 and then I would make the necessary text changes to the grant to include that section of sidewalk. So, I mean, if you want to do it, you might as well throw it in here and potentially get 80% of it funded. Mike, so 80 uh, of the 40? Hang, or? hang on a second. Michael just raised his hand. 40. I want to say, you know, I'd like it to be included in this, but I don't want to say this is absolutely the way it's going to be. There's too many folks that are trying to box us in all the time to, to one policy or another policy or another practice. I think the town is better served sometimes by keeping flexibility. You know, I don't, it, it seems as though we're always told, six months ago, you said this. 
And you know, it's, uh, you know, any other business does not tie itself down totally, like we're always being requested and suggested to be done. So you know, I'd like to say yes, we ought to include it in this, uh, but but I don't want to. You know, I would hope we could avoid commitments, saying, well, if this happens, we're not going to do this, we're not going to do that. It's so easy to make commitments sitting here on the fly at a meeting, but the real world doesn't work like that when you're in a competitive environment uh, looking for uh, funding. I cut Jim off, so Jim, you had a comment, but, then but Sarah. To me, like what Sarah's requested is to include it in the grant, um, Michael, for the purposes of being able to recoup 80% of the cost associated yeah. with building the sidewalk. Yeah. And I think that's what we were trying to get at, which I'm not sure I see us being boxed in other than to be well, inclusive in this grant application. Yeah, okay. if I might. I do because 600000 does not fund the entire shore road pathway, and this is a sidewalk that probably ought to be done regardless of what happens with the shore road pathway. And I wouldn't want this forever tied into that and handicapped that we could never touch it unless somehow shore road money came along. So I'm, I'm unclear, Mike, if I could interject. I'm unclear. Are you recommending one way or the Which way are you recommending? I'm clearly recommending it be included, but I'm also recommending that there be no other commitments made beyond that one way or included another. Included in the application. Just to, to maintain flexibility included. beyond that, because you know, I don't really think it's a part of the Shore Road pathway, and I don't want to tie it up with the Shore Road pathway political issues and other issues. So when you say included, you mean just included in the application included for the, the grant? We can try to get 80 percent, then okay. we ought to try to do it. Sarah. So just to clarify, tonight all we're doing is voting on authorizing the grant application. We're not voting on the, anything else. We're not right. voting on the, the sidewalk or blah, right. blah, blah. So we're authorizing, we're authorizing asking for money. Asking for money. Of MDOT. And the right. expansion to include that is necessary. And the, I'm sorry, and the, the, the right. additional 40,000 dollars. So it's not the original application. No, no, no. To, to have it right. added on to the application, but the, but it's just the application that we're actually voting on. And just disappointing clarification on, on this, um, not to put more uh, responsibility on the private fundraising effort, but is it a possibility that that incremental 8,000 could come from private fundraising and not have to come from the town budget? You can ask them to do that. Frankly, they're carrying a lot of water already. It's definitely the council's call. I, I would view this as a, a sidewalk issue, a town center sidewalk issue. I think, I think it's for safety reasons, it's a very appropriate and probably quite necessary to have them hook up together. I mean, I just have fears of rooting children through a parking lot, you know, have this nice path all the way and then dumping them into a parking lot. It's sort of, it does, that doesn't seem right to me safety-wise. Um, but in terms of the funding of it, yes, if we, I, I like the idea of throwing it onto the application, but um, any town investment in it, I, I don't view it as the shore road pathway, I view it as a sidewalk issue, so whatever money we have set aside for sidewalks, and I know we still have some sidewalk money set aside. So That's where I would view it coming from. I'm sorry. Penny. So, so in actuality, by saying that, uh, yes, I understand the openness around the dollars, and so that creates a opportunity to expend dollars on the sidewalk. So, in actuality, if we are approving uh, the dollar amount, you're, you're by default approving the sidewalk. Because we've already talked about, yeah, you are. It's inside there. All Mike is saying... We're approving the concept, the not concept, the construct, But the that's just like, I'm going to I'm gonna go back to the vote around the pathway. When you use the word concept, approving a concept, um, that can be read as, okay, I approve the, the idea that this could be done. Concept is a broad term. So are we approving the actual construction in so, at some future date of a sidewalk? Hang on, I'm going to what the votes were. 
I, th I thought it was concept plan. We, that's because that's what the plan was called. That's what we approved. It wasn't just sort of a concept of a path somewhere. It was. Yes, Mike's got the council votes here. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to argue with that. I'm not arguing with the vote. I'm just saying let's all be clear as to what is being voted on, because if we are <coughs> all agreeing that. Or if people are going to agree that a sidewalk is going to be designed and built eventually, whether it be part of uh, associated with a pathway um, um, grant proposal or not, what we're at there's two different things conversations going on here. So let's separate them and talk about them separately if they're separate things. That's all I'm saying. Sarah, maybe. Perhaps, this is just a suggestion, we should not add a request for 40000 additional dollars because as we're already learning, it's getting kind of murky on every level, financially and politically. Maybe we should just leave this as it is, approve it, and then talk about the sidewalk later since we already have bonded for it and we want it regardless of whether the path pathway goes in. It strikes me as very much a separate issue. So, so I'm kind of thinking getting them conjoining them could be problematic. Right. I think the issue is if it goes in with this, that 80% of it would be paid by the right. 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 Exactly. If, if they the approve the addition. But, yeah, if you don't put it in, then it's not, that's not an option. So the choice would be we'll pay this all ourselves at some point, mm -hmm. at some point or we can get 80% of it funded. It seems to me it's a no-brainer to yeah. add it in to the application. Jessica. But has this extra sidewalk already been approved? I'm unclear on that. The, Michael. Yeah, the, it was approved as part of the town center plan in the early 1990s. It was approved as part of the bond uh, project when the bond was first approved. Uh, subsequently, funds were approved to design it. It's been designed. Uh, it just uh, hasn't been funded. If I could. Uh, in fact, it was funded until all the there was a desire when the recession hit to rechannel some of the bond monies, and so the money was taken away. Maury. You also have a requirement in your zoning ordinance if any, any of the business owners along that frontage had to come in for site plan review, they would be required to build that sidewalk. So I think that when you adopted that requirement in your site plan regulations, it was, it was a statement by the town that they want sidewalks in the town center. Thank you. Frank. Uh, I'm just wondering if the concept of this additional piece of sidewalk was um, not approved, but rather developed within the context of a redesigned intersection. And then absent the redesigned intersection, it actually is not a great idea to bring a lot of traffic into the intersection. A lot of foot traffic? A lot of foot traffic. And, and I don't want to go back to being, being Neanderthal here, but it seems to me diverting traffic away, perhaps building a sidewalk through the parking lot, making it a safe place, and dumping it not in an intersection might not be a bad alternative. This isn't the place to discuss that. I'm just suggesting yes, please. that within the design of the existing intersection, maybe it's not as, as great an idea as it seemed originally. So. I recall from over the past, God, I don't know how many years, that sidewalk improvements have been discussed, approved, but not funded because of lack of capital improvement money. And you know, the whole concept, I hate to use the concept, the whole idea was that we would have sidewalks in the town center. It's part of the town center plan, and that's certainly the town center, in my opinion. And um, you know, I'm not a traffic engineer, but the, I, think, I think the idea of having sidewalks connecting to the shore road pathway is a good one and I, I'm with you Frank as for if we can you know put in our application all we're doing tonight is authorizing a grant application so what we're really talking about is what's the number whether we should authorize an application and what dollar number should go on the application and I'm in favor of having that dollar number be high enough so that it could cover 80 percent of that cost I don't know if we'll get it but I'd just as soon apply for it. So, Sarah. Sure. 
Okay. I move we authorize the Shore Road Pathway grant application set forth in our packet with an additional $40,000 added for possible construction of a sidewalk to go somewhere. Seconded. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any other discussion or further comments? Jessica. Yes, I have several. Um, having never seen a grant application, I've gone through this ad nauseum. <laughs> And I have some questions. Um, on, um, let's see, uh, page, let's see, section five, sensible transportation planning bo bonus points. What does that mean? Your community may receive additional bonus points if it has met some criteria listed below. To be eligible for these bonus points, please answer the following questions. What are they talking about? The, this grant application is prepared by MDOT, and if you want to get the grant money, you have to fill out the application. Uh, I read Section 5 to say that in addition to the typical things that you would look at when you're building bicycle and pedestrian facilities like safety and connectivity, they're also saying if you as a town are doing things that we consider um, cutting edge or the appropriate thing to do to make that transportation land use connection, then we're going to give you more bonus points when we're ranking these applications. So for example, if you have a comp plan, every town that has a comp plan that's been deemed consistent by the state usually benefits a little bit at grant time. And so yes, I said yes, we have a comp plan that's been deemed consistent. Uh, do you have ordinances that have implemented your comp plan. Again, they're trying to promote the whole comprehensive planning land use. And we do, and so I've made the argument that we're doing a very good job and we deserve to earn some points there. Um, it's a scoring system. So it, it's a scoring. ranking, gee, you're a little higher you ranking know. on the right. list of applicants if you have, I see, okay. I didn't really know. It's, it's, in 1991, the citizens of the state of Maine in a referendum approved a sensible transportation policy. It was subsequently amended by the legislature in 1993 uh, and again in, I think it was 2005. And the whole purpose of that sensible transportation policy is to look at alternatives to road building and to have folks uh, be in, you know, mode such as uh, transit and, uh, and walking and biking. And it, it, it all dates back to the sensible transportation policy approved by the voters. And if you, you follow those principles, then in some of these state programs, they, they give you more points as part of your application. Okay. Thank you. Did you have more questions? I have several more. Um, I understand, I, I have just learned tonight that um, a grant application, you certainly want to put your best foot forward. Um, and, and even though I'm certainly on public record as being very much against the Shore Road pathway, I still would see a document like this representing the town, whether I agree with it or not, as a very important document. And in that light, I have a couple suggestions. On section four, under community support, um, you know, again, I know you want to put your best foot forward, but I'd like to see something a little uh, different. Um, the last sentence states that held by the committee, uh, a public forum was held by the committee on November 19, 2008 demonstrates widespread support for the project as well as the attached emails. Um, actually, I, I wouldn't consider that widespread. It wasn't even two to one by the comments. I counted them. There were 31 pro and 18 con. So I, I'd just like to clean that up a little bit. I don't know if that's something you might consider. Um, the other comment I had is... Could, um, I, could I interject? Yeah. Would it be more accurate um, if I think they... I, I'm doing this off the top of my head. Weren't there like 600 people or something who signed some petition? I mean, if we just referenced, well, whatever it was, yeah, it was number. I think people. it was 500 signatures. It, just reference that. Would, yes, it would be more accurate to yes. say 500 people yep. out of so many citizens in town. You know, that would give the straight number. To me, yes, and I agree. It's more accurate. I mean, I I understand the the how you want to put your best foot forward and this sort of thing. But if if somebody goes and uh, somebody at the state level reads, you know, the, the uh, November 18 records and counts them, they're going to say, hmm, not even two to one. So my next question is um, um, under section, let's see, 
Well, it's under de describe the, the demonstrated needs. And <clears throat> I just, there's a reference to uh, Olympian Joan, Joan Benoit Samuel, Samuelson, which I think is unnecessary. It, what I, section are you? It's un it says, uh, it's under the section describe the demonstrated needs. It's under, um, let's see, section 3.3, .3, but it's near the end of that. And there's no page on my. Describe regional benefits, describe the demonstrated needs. Um, so let's see. After section 3.3, .3, it's one, two pages after that. And so, I mean, it, it seems to me were I a, a grant processor, obviously I'm not, but. To me, the fact that Joan Benoit Samuelson ran on Shore Road is not a demonstrated need for this grant to be approved. And I, I just, I don't know. It just, I didn't like that. Um, and um, let's see. Dave. If I could just respond to that last point. I mean, I, I took that comment to mean that this is a, an area where a lot of people run, and the fact that we have this unbelievable athlete who trained on these roads is just sort of add some local flavor to the application. So I actually thought it was entirely appropriate. But um, I'm just wondering if there are other specific comments. Well, I mean, you're welcome to keep going. I, I just, you know, I, I think there's, there's sort of arguments that could be made as to style or substance here. But I'm just not sure how productive it is to go through this it's item by item. But, uh, Maybe Jessica could just mute. I my own um, bias is to letting any, any counselor sh speak. So, yeah. no, I, uh, and I, I, I think Jessica's speak, that, but. No, no, I, I understand, and I know Jessica understands that we have a longer agenda, but right. I, I, I'll exercise the privilege of the chair to say just keep going, but keep going at a trot. Yeah. No, that, that's basically it. I mean, I think that, um, I just think if it's, if it's going forward and it's representing the town, I think it should be, Extremely accurate, and and and, and um, um, it, it, I don't think it needs a reference in that manner. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Okay, I, I can't even remember if we had a motion. Did we have a motion? Okay, and we had a second. Okay. Oh, that's right. Yes, to for with the added forty thousand. Um, okay, we're, uh, let's move to question. All in favor of the motion? One, two, three, four, five. Opposed? Two. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So, Maureen, you'll revise it to her our mo motion. Okay. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Item number 87, Fort Williams Park Capital Needs. Uh, Michael, did you want to introduce this? I'd, I'd be happy to. I, uh, I don't think anyone here is specifically from the Fort Williams Advisory Commission to speak in favor of this. No, I see one member here, but I, I don't think he's here for the commission. Uh, the Fort Williams Advisory Commission uh, has been seeking to identify different capital needs uh, they, I think they came forward with a very useful list, uh, one that, that demonstrates that, that there are some needs at the park, there are some wants at the park, there are some needs that ultimately probably will be funded uh, through uh, local tax or, or revenues generated within the park, and there are other needs that will have to be uh, paid for through uh, either grants or uh, uh, major donations. Uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, look at this and you know I, I, I think it, it, it it's, a, it's an excellent set of recommendations but I, I think it lacks some specificity as to some recommendations as to you know what needs to be done in year one year two and where those funds are going to come from and you know and in light of uh, you know other issues before you uh, particularly the next item uh, you know I think we ought to spend a little bit of time looking at the specific capital needs and and maybe coming back with some recommendations to you, uh, uh, you know, once is a better sense of uh, where some money might be coming from. 
Okay. So it, I think it would be in order to receive with thanks the report from the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. As they said in their cover memo, this is sort of a, 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 not a preliminary, but a draft. It wasn't meant to be a complete be all and end all kind of list. And um, I, had, I had asked, in case anybody was wondering, um, when we first got it, I was just having trouble paging back and forth, back and forth through the whole document. So I was the one who asked if we could, Michael, if we could just get a cover sheet. I know a couple of citizens have asked about that, so I was the one who asked for it. I just thought it would be more useful to have it all on one page. So it's in order to receive the report. Um, so do I hear a motion? I'm sorry. Did, uh, did someone from the public want to speak? I'm sorry. I didn't realize. Please come forward, Mr. Prince, and state your name. Fred Prince, to Rocky Hill Road. When I pulled up this report, I thought it was a nice report. It didn't answer one question, which was show me the money. I need a new car. The Rolls Royce would be very nice, but I can't afford it. As I look down this list, I see a lot of things that can be deleted very quickly. Battery blare, gone. The uh, bleaches, I don't think anybody comes to the fort to sit in those things. Bury them. Guarded mansion, I don't think anybody comes to the fort to sit in guarded mansion. It's falling down, we can make money on that. If you go down this list, this is not a needs list, this is a dreams list. And I think in this economy at this time, we have to separate the dreams and get to reality. What can we afford? The fort has to be safe for people who come in there. But we don't have to do a lot of the stuff which is down here. And I think from now on, when you get a report from the fort committee and they're asking you for money, you tell them on that report they have to have where the funding comes. This is a joke. It's gone on too long. It's about time you people ask the people who come back to you and ask for money, where is the money? The fork can be a tremendous revenue generator if you want to turn it into that. And we don't have to have these arguments from this point on. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Prince. And if I could just correct a few things um, or, or add to your statement, uh, just for the record, uh, this list of... Um, asking for money, as you said, was not the Fort Williams Advisory Commission asking the council for money. It was just a list of needs, some needs, some wants, some pie-in-the-sky dreams, as you said, but they, it's their job to advise the council. So please don't think that they were coming to us and saying, here, give us six million, you know, we need six million dollars today or at some time in the future. So if I could just finish, Mr. Prince. But I think and, there's a difference when you Mr. Are Prince, Mr. Prince, if I, could, if I could just finish, please. Yep, I'm sorry. It's okay. And then everyone, I would say, has different opinions about what's important at the fort. I know that several um, people here in the council and probably hundreds of other people in town went to high school graduation over the weekend. And when you said nobody goes to the fort to sit in the bleachers, they're used at graduation. So yes, some people do use those bleachers and I know they're used for Little League games um, for, for spectators. So I offer that only as one example. Um, I know you have strong opinions about what is needed and not needed at the fort, but I can assure you that the council has heard from many other citizens who have different views about what's needed and important. It's not the council's um, thought to try to push through uh, plans that are unrealistic, but it is also prudent uh, f fiscal stewardship for the council to be aware of what the uh, capital improvement needs are at the fort. So I just wanted to let you know that that's not what this document was about. And uh, I, think, I think the advisory commission was doing their best to advise us, so I commend them for their hard work on this. And repair the bleaches is a waste of money. That's your prerogative. But thank you very much. Is there anyone else who wanted to speak on, on this subject? Okay. We're back to the council. Um, 
Michael, oh, I'm sorry, Sarah. Are we going to designate a time when we go through this and weigh in on what our priorities are and so forth, like a workshop? Well, I think that if I don't, if you go ahead. could address that, I'm kind of, kind of bundling two or three things together yes. here. Um, we appreciate your comments, Mr. Prince. I mean, we, we as a council are wrestling with the very questions and the issues that you bring to us. Um, we had a resounding vote last week that stated in no uncertain terms what the community feels about fees. And the advisory um, committee is equally um, dealing with where do we go from here? And, and how do we get there? And how is it going to be paid for? There's a lot in here that's all about preservation, historic education, yet the fundamentals in the in the park are the basics, the safety, <laughs> and allowing people to be able to, to, to freely access the park without a worry that a, a brick from a chimney that's caving in or falling down is going to hit them on the head. I mean, we've got all this here. Uh, the acceptance of this today, I mean, we have a stewardship uh, plan for the town. My hope is that this group will give to the manager this report so that he can then go back through and look at this and synthesize what should or shouldn't be there and understand reality going forward so that we can, as a council, uh, direct what's taking place in this park because everyone is very, very concerned about it. We now know it should stay free and we have a lot of work ahead of us. This was just an attempt to at least get the discussion going. And I don't think, uh, and I don't think that, the, that the Fort Williams Advisory uh, Group um, uh, passed this along in sort of short shrift. There was debate and discussion and serious debate at the final meeting where it was accepted from those members who weren't all that in favor of some of the components. But at the end of the day, we asked them to come forward with a report. They did. They did exactly what they were supposed to do. And I just uh, feel the council should accept this. And what I am going to suggest in a, in a future item is that we have a workshop with the Fort Williams Advisory uh, Group. And for that matter, in talking to fellow councilors, there may be the need to have other constituents that have a vested interest like the charitable trust and possibly the group that has been formulated to do arboretum work. All these folks have, have real passion for what they, they, they feel about our park. And I just think that we need to get to the answer and come up with a vision and a strategy. And we need to, we need to have legs with it. It just can't continue to be what it is. Um, and um, anyway, for what it's worth, uh, you know, I don't know whether it's time to, to make a motion to accept this with our thanks and move on to the I, next item. But I, first of all, I want to say thank you, Jim, because I know you've done a lot of work um, on the issue of Fort Williams and you've been attending a lot of the Advisory Commission meetings and you're, you're up on the subject. You're sort of our point person on, on Fort Williams. In answer to Sarah's question, I had anticipated at the next item we'd be suggesting a workshop. I think the workshop that whether we make, whether Jim makes the motion now or in the next item, I think there's going to be probably a workshop and it will cover both capital needs and also funding solutions, whatever, mm -hmm. depending upon whatever those capital needs are. Um, so uh, we can make that motion now and then tack on to it next, the next item or we can wait until the next item. Does that satisfy your concern? Okay. Were there, were there other questions or comments? I just had one Jessica. question. I was just curious as to, um, in the capital needs, uh, they have a category of unknown source. Just wondering why that was changed from private. I can't say. Well, Michael, go ahead. Uh, I can answer that one, and I can give a specific reason. They listed grants or donations. Uh, again, in keeping... In, in, in unknown source, I was the one that changed that was in the summary. 
and it's in keeping with my earlier comments about not trying to get boxed in all the time. And I'll use one example. There's a suggestion that there be an arboretum and that it raise $3.5 million to an arboretum. Part of the list of the arboretum is to remove in invasive species. And, you know, I saw some comments during the recent debate is, you know, why don't you just move the, remove the uh, invasive species and at least do that? Why do you have to wait for the whole arboretum? And so, you know, I don't want to get tied down again that, you know, the town can't remove invasive species. You know, we, with one of the issues with the fort, this is an opinion, is that we keep allowing ourselves to get sidetracked into someone else's agenda. And, and then, you know, the, the town itself isn't then doing its responsibility to take, to take care of some of, some of the day-to-day -day maintenance things. I, I look at, you know, I look at that particularly with the Arboretum because there's, there's other things we could be doing. Uh, I look at that with the Goddard Mansion that, you know, you, you can't touch it without, you know, even routine maintenance without getting, getting handicapped somehow. And, you know, there's, there's other examples that, that I could mention as well uh, that, uh, you know, I, I think it really, some of these are unknown sources and I, you know, again, I, I, I don't want to, I don't think the town ought to allow itself to be boxed in. Well, a year ago you said everything involving the Arboretum was going to be paid for privately. Uh, you know, and the other thing that happens is because something is listed as a grant or an Arboretum, there's an, or excuse me, a grant or a donation, there's an assumption that somehow someone's already given the money or it's paid, or it's paid for. And, you know, I, there was a recent study done for the Fort Wayne's Charitable Foundation which showed really uh, an inability to raise big bucks for the park. Uh, you know, it's, and it's just not a realistic assumption based on what their fundraising consultant told them. Uh, so I, I think it really, when you look at all of these needs, uh, I think in wants, uh, we don't know the sources. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I think it's time to move forward. And, and I would suggest uh, a motion with word wording to receive the report because to accept the report somehow implies we're affirming that we're buying into everything that's in the report. So I would say the terminology receive the report would be in order. Sarah. Uh, with gratitude, I move we receive and consider the report from the Fort Williams Advisory Commission regarding capital needs for the park. Thank you. Is there a second? Seconded. Okay. Any further discussion? Um, <laughs> all, I'm sorry, I looked over. <laughs> sorry. Sarah lost her pen. Um, all in favor? It's unanimous. Great. Thank you. And I, I do want to um, echo Sarah's motion and, and thank the advisory commission. Whether they were all in agreement or not, I think they worked hard to try to, try to put together information on a very difficult subject. And uh, we will use their work as we move forward to ensure that the fort stays the gem that we hope it will always continue to be. So thank you. OK. Moving on to a related topic, this is item number 88, which has to do with um, Fort Williams Park revenues. Michael, did you want to say anything about your Not bus, really. bus fee memo? Oh, you want to talk about bus fees? Well, well, that's... well no, before we get to bus fees, can, can, can I, would you mind, Michael, let me jump in on this one? Yeah. On the revenue go, side. Go for it. I was laying back for a while. So. I know you were kind of waiting. <laughs> yeah. uh, the Fort Williams uh, um, advisory uh, group has been studying this question of revenue opportunities in the park and have spent many hours, including some workshop time, directed by an outside facilitator so that they could delve into the question and, and try to answer the fundamental question of how the revenue generating opportunity is consistent with the mission of the park. And in that process, they have developed some criteria. We haven't applied that criteria yet to a revenue generating opportunity, but the manager has taken 100, about 125 or 30 or so 
suggestions that have come through various venues in town, some directed to individuals at this table, but also from the curtailment meetings that were held during the school budget process, as well as um, suggestions that came through when we were running for election, hearing, hearing citizens, and then through this last debate about keep it free. Um, and he has been able to synthesize that list down to about 41 suggestions, 41 different buckets, if you will, of ideas or suggestions for revenue opportunities. The next advisory meeting, we're going to take one or two of those, and we're going to test the Fort Williams advisory criteria or hypothesis, call it whatever you wish, for, with, with a couple of those, those revenue opportunities, to just to see where does, it, where does it fall? Can it be done? If in fact, it, if it's an operational problem, is it a safety issue? Do we need to involve public safety? Do we need to involve DPW? I mean, what do we have to do here to get this done? We've heard unbelievable suggestions, fabulous suggestions. Some of them are possible. Some of them are just completely out there, and there's no way that that will ever happen. But there has been a lot of work done quietly. And for the record, that's really what I want to put on the table here. Because if you read some emails we've received, you'd think we've done nothing about it. But there's been a lot of work done. So this whole revenue concept now, because it's, been, it's very clear from the citizens that it's going to be free, um, this is one of those components that has to be put on the table and the council needs to understand that the Fort Williams Advisory uh, Group is, is, is attacking this thing head on. Where it goes from here, I can't tell you. But we have, we have uh, setback issues relative to uh, f you know, flood zones, and we have no water out there, and some, we, we have no sewerage, we have, we have noise ordinances, we have, uh, you know, you name it. We have all those things that we have to now factor into the requests that are being made of us. The managers had a request in a relatively, what, the last week or so from a citizen who wanted to suggest a rally, a car rally for sports cars of some kind at our Ford. Anti-car auction. Anti-car auction. And it would have been a revenue generator for us. But because of the process we have in place to evaluate that request, it can't be done in time. So we're leaving. How many thousands of dollars on the table? Probably about 3,000. About 3,000 on the table. So we even have administrative processes that have to be looked at and figured out. Because we just, you know, we're not as nimble at this. And if this now is the wave of the future for this park, we've got to get better at it. And so I just want to make sure that people understand that that part of this whole revenue piece is, um, is something we're working on. And I, I would. You know, I would love to have something uh, real to present here, but we're still in the sort of uh, study phase. But, but I will tell you, this, the advisory group has worked, worked very hard to really get a handle on it. And my hope is that we're going to have something real very soon. Good. Thank, so. thank you for that report. If I could suggest for this item, I, I know from your comments during the previous item that um, you want to make a motion to have a workshop, and I would entertain that motion. But I also think it would be helpful, I brought along, and with the council's indulgence, um, I brought along item number 27 from back in February, which had all the votes that we made pertaining to the Fort Williams fees issue. And I thought perhaps we could go through those a after the motion for the, for the uh, workshop, we could go through those item by item and in each one it could sort of structure our conversation about are we still in support of that piece or are we not? And in that way we can deal with the election uh, results for parking fees last week and then in another section we'll be able to deal with bus fees and it would just, I think, help <laughs> structure our um, discussion if that's okay with my fellow counselors. 
Can I just ask a quick question before we embark sure. on that? Sure. Just for the short term, before we do all this work and have a grand plan, I'm sort of concerned that we're giving up opportunities for thousands of dollars. So my question is, how can, in the short term, how can we streamline the process for applying for temporary uses of the fort that don't take so long that we have to say no to these people? Mike. You know, most events that are going to happen during the 2010 season I already planned. There may be one or two that, that we missed this year. I would think you might want to look at streamlining <coughs> the plan with an eye toward events that might happen in 2011 and beyond. I, I, I think to do anything, you know, in the very short term to change that process uh, in the reviews that occur, uh, you know, might, might cause a, a lot of angst without a whole lot of immediate uh, benefit. Okay. Jim, would you like to make your motion about the workshop? Uh, well, I, I'd like to make a motion that, um, that the uh, town council um, schedule a workshop to discuss uh, Fort Williams Park Revenue Capital Plan mm -hmm. um, administrative processes call it strategic vision, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and I would suggest that that be scheduled um, either July, August, or September. And I'm not sure whether we book those three um, workshops at this point, but I think the sooner we get to this, the better we'll all feel about what we're trying to accomplish here at the port. Mike and I can look at the schedule of workshops and, and uh, try and get it on the workshop schedule as soon as is feasible, recognizing that it's a very important topic. So if we have to do some shifting, we will. Okay. Um, so your motion would include capital needs, discussion of capital needs, discussion of park revenue opportunities, and also streamline processes, and anything else related to that. Right. Okay. I'd second that. Okay. Um, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any other discussion? Okay. All in favor of the workshop motion. Okay, it's unanimous. Thank you, and thank you again, Jim, for that. Um, I'm sorry. I, would we also consider inviting the advisory commission to that workshop? I, I meant yeah, to. I, I think that, that a couple of councils have some thoughts on that, and maybe to, I, I, I'm, you know, again, I, I'm, I guess I sort of assumed that, yeah. but I, I think it would yeah. be very yeah. a very good idea to have them included. So should and we perhaps include that in the motion just so that it's clear to those at home or who read this after the fact? I don't want anybody not to. Uh, I, don't, I don't feel the need to okay. redo the motion, no. but okay. I think it, we're all, the consensus is that yes, we should be inviting them. Okay. And there may, we may well want to invite people from the Charitable Foundation and anybody who's from, who can represent the Arboretum Committee too. Yes. So. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, I will pass out, I had Michael pass out, uh, I'm sorry, run off just copies of what we voted on back in February. And they're, they're sort of chunked, chunked out because we broke the question apart. Um, and so, I'll wait till everybody gets it. Have you all got... Yeah, do you, do you need any more? Okay, we've got extras. Thank you. Um, item number 27, this was back in February 8th at our meeting then, our business meeting. Um, our first motion was that the council agrees that Fort Williams Park should remain free of any entry charges. That was as opposed to parking charges. Um, and that we agreed to establish a Fort Williams Park Special Revenue Fund, basically pull out any revenues and um, expenses associated with parks so that we could account for things um, separately. Michael, do you want to address that? Did, you, did anybody else need any extra? We've yeah, got a few extra here. We've got two more if anybody wants them. So, Michael, did you want to address yeah. just the, the accounting sort of issue there? I would like to not do it this evening because, one, it's getting late, and two, I, 
the our auditors have to be here doing the pre-audit work, and there's some new GASB Rule 54, which says that the majority of the assets of the special revenue fund have to be from a source other than the property tax. So I, based on that new GASB rule, which takes effect uh, July 1, 2010, I just assume we defer this until after the workshop. Okay. Could we uh, reiterate at least the free of entry charges piece? Or, or I'd like reaffirm to, that? If how'd, you, are... how'd you like to make that motion? <laughs> I would move that we uh, reaffirm the vote from last February that Fort Williams should remain free of any entry charges. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I would move that we reaffirm uh, the vote from last February that Fort Williams Park should remain free of any entry charges. Including buses and trolleys and everything? No, entry no, charges. Entry, mean, entry, entry, not entry, parking. Not parking. Entry. Entry. Park. So do I hear a second? I second that. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? This was the least controversial. <laughs> <laughs> this one was really a good one. This one was easy. This was a, remember, that's this one was unanimous last time. I'm <laughs> hoping for unanimous this time. All in favor? Look at that. Great. Okay, we got unanimous on that one. Okay, I, I would suggest, per um, according to what Mike just said, uh, that we defer taking any opinion. Well, that we perhaps we need a motion since we we moved that we have a separate special revenue fund. Should we have a motion to just defer implementing that <clears throat> until we figure out the accounting? Yeah, I would move that we defer implementation of the Fort, William, Fort Williams Park Special Rev Revenue Fund pending uh, consideration and review of the generally accepted accounting principles and how they may apply here. Second. That flowed really well. Okay. It's been <laughs> moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? discussion? Okay. All in favor? That's unanimous. Great. Okay. Uh, the next motion that we had uh, approved back in February was the one that had to do with fees, parking fees for vehicles, and there was a fee schedule of daily parking $5, resident annual parking $10, non-resident annual parking $20, um, and you'll, you'll see the rest of that. It talked about fees for people. The fee wouldn't be collected for graduation, family fun day, engine one, or sports events. Does anybody want to make a motion on that? Dave. I would move that we not move forward with the proposed parking fees uh, as outlined in our February vote. And I really want to make it clear I'm, I'm limiting this to non-buses, because my understanding is we're going to discuss that issue later on. Yes, that's These coming are just up. people coming into the fort in a car okay. and parking. Okay. It, would someone like to second that? Second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Sarah. I'd just like to thank the incredibly energetic and passionate and involved and vocal <laughs> citizenry for weighing in on this. I think the strength of our town is that so many people care about so many issues and they show up to vote. We had an incredible voter turnout and whatever side you're on and whatever outcome you wanted it to be, I would just cheerlead the outpouring of opinion. I think it's great. Any other comments? Go ahead. Okay. Oh, I'm just sorry. Just, just explain that motion again, please. The motion was, if you can see on this printed thing, yep. It said ordered effected April 1st, 11. Basically, we're not moving forward with that. We had voted for, um, by majority, the council had voted right. for fees. These are the non-bus fees. These mm -hmm. were parking fees for vehicles, the $5 daily fee, et cetera, et cetera. And so David's motion is to not move forward with that. So basically, no fees, no parking <coughs> fees for non-buses. Okay? Right. Okay. I would just add um, that it is clear from the election results two things to me, and that is that people love the fort, no matter where, how they voted. They love the fort. And secondly, they don't want the fort to be paid, paid for with parking fees on cars. 
Oh, I mean, at least the great majority of them that voted didn't. Um, so it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? It's unanimous. Okay. Um, I don't think we need the next vote was a vote to re, uh, the February vote was a vote to amend the motion to remove the resident parking fee. I don't think we need to deal with that. Um, and then there was a vote to amend the original motion to set an par annual parking fee of $25. I don't think we have to deal with that. Uh, then there was a motion about daily parking fees for renters of the picnic shelter. Um, and it had to do with special events. I, I don't think we have to deal with that. Uh, the next motion was to actually send this to referendum. It already happened, so we don't have to deal with that. So the next motion down that halfway down the second page had to do with bus fees. We had authorized the town manager to meet with bus tour representatives and um, we asked him to propose fees to the council no later than July 15th of 2010. He has proposed, uh, he did meet with them and would you like to tell us about what you came up with on bus fees? And then we'll have a motion on it. Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to. We had uh, a meeting, uh, Jim Walsh was there, Councillor Walsh, uh, uh, Gene Gross from the uh, Museum of Portland Headlight, uh, and representatives from various interests uh, in the tour touring industry, including those affiliated with the cruise ships and th that, that busing operation, uh, the trolley that comes to the park, the Convention and Visitors Bureau, uh, main tour connection, which brings different cruise cruise buses to the park. Uh, the, the meeting was prior to the vote uh, of last Tuesday, uh, and there was concern with the, the inequity of different fees for different types of buses. Uh, you know, why should cruise ships be different than other types of buses that had been suggested uh, by, uh, you know, by the, the, the original recommendation from the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. Uh, there was concern that the fees overall were too high. Uh, in terms of, you know, generally what these buses pay in other places. There was a lot of concern expressed about the fairness of who you get the money from and how you get the money from them, uh, particularly as it relates to, you know, how do you, how do you notify the buses in advance of, of the fee? And, you know, and we talked about having extra people stationed there this fall to hand out brochures. That, that was all discussed during the meeting. Uh, and, but we also discussed the, the real challenge with, you know, it's easy, relatively easy to collect it from, you know, the cruise ships, people coming in, and from the, the regularly scheduled tours. The challenge is, is, you know, you have a lot of other buses that just come in that you're not expecting, that might come in just a single year, may not come back, and how do you really collect those? Uh, the, one of the challenges is a lot of them arrive uh, at very odd different times of the year, different times of the day. Uh, they also arrive at the same time as other buses do, and you know, I've counted it as many as 12 buses in the traffic circle uh, down there at the lighthouse at, in, at any given moment. Uh, so it really you know, came back to, you know, if, if we were to have a bus fee, we, we needed to have the person who was going to be monitoring the paid display uh, units to also note when the buses come in, and, and to, uh, we even talked about having a little credit card, uh, although the phone service is real bad down at the park. One of the, the, the like when you return a rent a car where you, you put the credit card in and you get the slip back and, you know, different ways of doing it. Of, of having some billing operations, uh, you know, with the cruise ship company, with the in, intercruises that provide that service locally. It was, we, we went over a lot of technical issues. Uh, and anyway, came back with a proposal uh, based on those discussions uh, that we establish a system where we, you, you, rather than try to spell it all out, that you would authorize the manager to work out payment arrangements with, with, with the frequent users. You know, the, the, you could, we could work on a building operation with the cruise, with the buses that come in, the cruise ships, with main tour connections, some of those that come in, so that, you know, it doesn't need to be the same system for everyone as long as, you know, the, the fees are equal and they're paid. 
uh, the, the importance of it was, was getting the fee paid. Uh, so anyway, came up with a, a recommendation that it be thirty-five dollars uh, per uh, uh, one-time use fee for for a bus. Uh, that an annual fee or a tr uh, that there be an annual fee of a thousand dollars for a trolley or a bus making thirty or more visits in a season. A little bit awkward to figure out thirty, but you know there, there are some of the same buses come back. Uh, that it would be paid at the gift shop at Portland Headlight or to an on-site attendant, uh, and as I said, to, to we'd, we could establish billing arrangements. Uh, you know, when the referendum didn't pass last week, it an issue came up of well, you know, how's this attendant going to be paid for? Who's going to be watching after it? And did an analysis and didn't change any of the fourth committee numbers, but did an analysis based on the number of buses they estimated that the revenue would be about thirty thousand one twenty-five per year looked at having the attendant 175 of the 214 days that have been discussed. Uh, and having that person there at eight hours, pay them 1360 an hour, which is the same as the Rangers. And anyway, it, it came out that with the assumptions the Fort Williams Advisory Committee used, the profit after expenses after paying for the attendant uh, would be $8,125 per year. Uh, if, there were, if there were more buses, the profit would be greater. If there were fewer buses, the profit would be less. The buses also, you know, it's worth noting, provide 33% of the gross income at Portland Headlight at the museum gift shop, uh, thus providing $150,000 each year in income uh, to the gift shop, or about $70,000 profit when you look at it's it's uh, it's almost double, but not quite. Uh, so, you know, therefore, my suggestion is the council should be very cautious in approving fees solely for buses and trolleys. And I wrote this prior to the outcome of the vote, uh, just prior, although it, the vote, as they said, w was totally expected. Uh, but regardless, uh, you know, I, you know, I know there's other debates and discussions of, you know, should the park be free, should it not be? I, I read a lot of signs myself that said the park ought to be free. But I think to risk the sales at the lighthouse, which have been tremendously profitable both for the maintenance of the lighthouse, which, which is really the most impo important thing down there. That, you know, that's what most of the folks go for. It's a landmark, it's on the National Register. You know, that, the monies have to go there for us. But it has done other things for the park. It, it helped after Gus Barber donated the initial cliff walk. It provided extensions improvements for the cliff walk. All the landscaping that's from Battery Blair, uh, in front of Battery Blair, and then heading down to the lighthouse also paid for by the lighthouse all of the work of the entry gate uh, this past year, uh, you know, sprucing up the entrance. That was all paid for. The monies, in part, for the interpretive signs were paid for by, by the museum. And the other thing is museum sales are down. They're down about 50000 because of the economy. And then, you know, we, we see weekends compared to what they were. We were, up, we were up to about half a million a year. Now we're down to about four fifty a year. I, I really question doing buses, and I know buses are politically popular, but I think, you know, if the citizens knew it was only 8,000 and you were risking 150,000, you know, I think the citizens might have a different opinion. Uh, so, you know, it's, it, it's, it's easy to say, well, so-and-so said this, so-and-so said that, but, but I don't, I'm not so sure everyone's looking at these numbers. So, you know, based on all of the information that I'm aware of, you know, I recommend that the council not adopt bus and trolley fees for 2011. Uh, I think uh, it just doesn't bring in the money, and uh, there's, there's problems in the equity of collecting it, particularly because even, you know, how many are going to actually go in the lighthouse and pay during those off days, and, you know, while the attendants at lunch and those issues. Uh, it, 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 it would have been a lot easier to collect it if you had attendants there also looking at the pay display, but without the pay display, it, all of the costs for monitoring has to fall back uh, onto this. So that's uh, what happened with the bus meeting and uh, a little bit of numbers and a little bit of opinion. So thank you. Thank you for that outline. Did you want to make a motion? I'm just wondering if I could make a motion and then we could have the discussion. Keep would that be? If... Uh, I would move uh, that the council not move forward with uh, fees for the buses and trolleys uh, for 2011. Is there a second? Second. 
been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Did you want to talk about your motion? I, I, and I appreciate the uh, town manager's analysis of the, uh, the potential fee income and the expenses associated with collecting those fees, but I just view this as an issue of fairness. Uh, the, the town citizens spoke loud and clear that they want the park to be free to visitors, and I just cannot come up with a difference between somebody who happens to enter the park sitting in their own car versus someone who's sitting in a tour bus, because that person sitting in the tour bus is going to pay that fee that is levied on the bus company or the tour company, et cetera. So it, to me, it's just an issue of fairness. And it may just be, I mean, I heard from one citizen who said, well, it'll be a minis minuscule charge for each person on the bus. But that, that, to me, that's beside the point. We're charging fees for some people to enter the park. And I just don't think that's fair. So buses are an easy target. People think they're making a lot of money off the fort. But at the end of the day, I'm afraid those fees are just going to get passed along to those customers. And if it should be free for somebody who's going to drive in, which that's what the town wants, and it ought to be free for somebody who comes in on a bus. So uh, I'm totally opposed to moving forward with bus fees for buses or trolleys. Okay. Any comments? Oh. Jessica. Well, in my view, that there is a difference, and the difference is that the tour buses are commercial for-profit entities, and in that regard are very different from just a, an individual or family that's coming into the fort. So I, I think we should still consider that. I recognize that there are difficulties, absolutely, and I'm very pro-business and small business, but we do have some daunting financial challenges for the fort, and we have seen an incredible growth in the number of commercial buses that come into the fort. Um, we provide porta potties for them. We certainly hope they uh, buy things at the museum. Again, the museum supports mostly the headlight and not the fort. So I think that there, I think there is a very reasonable difference here. Sarah, I'm happy to vote it down for 2011 because there's so much lack of clarity. Although I would take. I would suggest an alternative to your numbers, and I think 175 days, eight hours a day, is a very extreme version of what the possibilities are. What if you had it 77 days, which is basically summer break, at five or six hours a day? You'd still collect the lion's share of the money. It would be significantly less. So, or you could come up with an alternative way to collect fees, like the honor system. You don't really need somebody sitting there, but that's a, that's a detail. My, my larger picture response is, given that we don't have a plan yet, of the fort and what this revenue generation is going to be. Are we going to have a visitor center? Are we going to have a restaurant? Are we going to have some ice cream vendors? Are we going to have a drop dead place to get married? How can we then make these small decisions? So I sort of feel like this is carpet before the horse. In the short term, I agree we should vote it down in the spirit of this first wave that we've gone through, which is we don't want to charge parking fees. But maybe going forward, we do want to levy some Thing on these companies that are actually making money of our, on our fort, not to mention the wear and tear on our <coughs> roads and the, the, the sort of downward pressure on everyone who lives on Shore Road. It's kind of a drag in the summer. There's tour buses zooming up and down all day. It actually impacts our citizens in a kind of a positive in that they buy from our, from our museum, but negative way. And why is that just a freebie? So I guess I feel like it's a more complex issue in the in the big picture, broad terms, future. Although for the short term, I kind of agree, it gets rolled into the package of no parking fees. So I guess I'm saying it's a little more complex than just at the surface, are we going to charge buses? It's like, what's our big picture plan? Thank, thank you. Uh, Frank. Just Mike, if you can clarify the numbers on the uh, <coughs> gift shop again. Um, you were talking about gross revenues, I think, not actually net profit. That's right. So um, when you look at the net profit of the um, shop, which last year was the business was like $8,000 or something, um, what we're saying is that the buses represent a third of that $8,000. I, I, true, Huey. I, I don't think I'm really saying that because if the buses weren't there, mm -hmm. we would have had a significant loss. You know, it depends on, you know, last dollar in, first dollar in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I guess I agree with Sarah in terms of the fact that we need a big, we need a big picture assessment of this, and I have absolutely no problem charging the buses. Sorry, to different, <laughs> different, different David, but they're 
profit-making entities. It's completely different in my view than residents or even neighbors nearby coming into the town. So I, I would want to charge buses. I think it needs to be fully evaluated in the context of everything we're going to be doing in the park. Uh, how we treat the buses will change dramatically if we end up putting many more commercial activities in the park, whether it's restaurants or a bigger <coughs> shop, and then we re reassess it and figure out what the net positive and negative is. I mean, we make it to a point where there's enough revenue coming out of there without buses that we want to discourage buses from coming in. Who knows? We just don't know at this point. Maybe this vote's premature. Yeah, yeah I agree with Sarah and Frank. The, the conversation with the, um, with the bus companies was, was kind of interesting because there was a significant discussion that, was, uh, that took place around the value proposition that was provided for the fee that we were going to charge the bus, i.e. simple things like a paved walkway from parking to the, to the Portland Head Lighthouse. So a lot of the folks who have, are a little uneasy on their feet relative to the crushed stone there would have an easier way to get to the museum store and so forth. They're also about bathrooms. A lot of discussion about that. That if you're gonna charge this type of, of fee and you go to a state park or, or a, you know, Acadia, you're going to have a bathroom facilities that are not porta potties. So there was a lot of that kind of value added discussion. So you're absolutely right, Frank, down the road, if we have the larger picture flushed out and a better strategy, then certainly we can revisit this. The other thing is that the model that Michael presented, we made an assumption that we would have had pay and display and that we were going to ride a piece of this cost, if you will, and, and that was going to be an add-on to what we already had in place. So one of, the, I mean, one of the, the thoughts I've had since we had the resounding decision on the part of our citizens is what if we permitted these businesses to access our park? You know, you buy a permit. You know, if I'm, a, if I'm the trolley operator, they would have to buy, you know, a medallion as a, you know, in, to, to operate or the clothes have to the duck boats have to have a permit to operate, then why wouldn't we charge them a permit fee to come into our park, which would eliminate chasing buses in and out or worried about whether they come in at 10 in the morning or 6 o'clock at night. They would just have to, to, to get a permit, not unlike registering your car with us. But Is that a simpler way to do it? I don't know. I mean, I'm just suggesting as a concept. How do you police it, though? Yeah, that, well, that was my I, question. Again, how do you police, police it? it? But you know, again, it's it's you know it could be you know we could work something out, but I, I don't know. I, I really don't know. Okay. But a medallion, you know, the buses. If the buses are the same buses, then obviously they would have some some identification. But I don't know. I mean, it, but again, the model that we used when we had the discussion with the bus companies was a very different one than we have currently on the table. So. Okay. David? If uh, I had assurances that the bus companies wouldn't pass along the fee to their customers, I'd be all for it. Uh, but I just think it's unrealistic to expect that they're not going to take that $50 charge and spread it out among the people sitting on the bus. So we're basically charging people who don't know any better, because they probably don't understand they're being levied this fee, and we're telling people, hey, it's free for you unless you're riding in on a bus. And I think that's unfair and frankly discriminatory. Um, so. Again, my motion was specifically limited to 2011 because I understand that there could be more work done here that might convince me otherwise. So I, I was limiting it to that on purpose. Mm -hmm. so. so let's just vote on that. That's easy. Any further comments? Um, I'd like to uh, just weigh in briefly. Uh, what we voted on in February w said that we, the town, shall collect fees. So unless we... Do you know, deal with it tonight. We will be, the default position is we will be charging bus fees. Um, I agree with David. I think, well, I have two reasons for supporting his motion to not have bus fees for 2011. One is the <clears throat> equity issue. I think it's very clear from the vote that people, at least the signs, it says keep it 
keep it free. And I think people wanted it free. And I think that meant free. And just because someone who may be a, a, an older, someone who skews demographically older, um, you know, the people who go on bus tours tend to be older than the average citizen, just because they're older and are riding in on a bus as opposed to being able to drive in in their own vehicle, I don't see why we should be charging them. I, I too think that uh, we would be charging them because the bus company is just going to pass the fee right through. The other issue is I think for $8,000 I, I really don't want to roll, roll the dice to monkey with the only proven <laughs> revenue that we have out there at the fort right now. So I'm not willing to uh, risk our $70,000 profit at Portland Headlight gift shop for the chance of getting eight th maybe $8,000 in uh, parking fees for buses. So I'll be supporting the motion for 2011. And I agree, depending upon what happens uh, with other uh, revenue ideas, this may all change uh, one way or the other in the next year. So I think everybody's had a chance. The motion is to as I understand it, to not have bus fees for 2011, or for, for 2010 and 2011. That's correct. Okay. Can, can we say that, and this will be integrated into the uh, conversations about revenue for Fort Williams? I, I don't mean to nits little details, but... Future plans, you future mean, after 2000, after the 2010-11. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's fine with me. I didn't make motion. That's acceptable. Okay, and I can't remember who seconded it, but is that okay with you, Sarah? Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Would you repeat then the entire motion, please? Um, do you want to repeat it? Or I can take a stab. Take a stab to not move forward charging buses and trolleys for the 2010 2011 season. <laughs> Beyond that. And with. You and to include it in the revenue workshop or revenue discussions at workshop or something. For 2010 and 2011. So we're talking about the rest of this summer yeah. and next summer, basically. That's right. Um, and as Jim said, to include discussion, discussion. Bus, bus fees, <coughs> potential bus fees as a discussion in future discussions of revenue sources. Why are we including 2011? Because that's his motion. I don't know how to say this in a parliamentary manner, but I, I think that it's a confusing amendment to the motion, and I would like to keep it separate. You what? I think that's a confusing addition to the original motion. So you want to separate it into two I, motions? I would prefer to separate that into two motions myself. It's, it's, according to council rules, it's entirely appropriate for a councilor to ask to separate the question. So do you want to, um, David, want to have your original motion to just not have bus fees for 2010, 2011. And, and uh, yes, that's fine with me to separate. Period. The and then yes. we can address Penny's issue in a second. Why are we including oh. this summer? Okay. That's Everybody cool. clear on what the motion is? Okay. All in favor? One, two. I'm sorry. Six. Opposed, one. Okay. Penny, do you want to make a motion yes. uh, to deal with your concern there? Let's see. Basically, it's that um, fees for buses would be incorporated into uh, future discussions relative to revenues for the fort. Does that? Yeah. Second. It? Yep. Okay. Any discussion or on that one? All in favor? It's unanimous. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, the next item is item number 89. And uh, Penny had to recuse herself from this because one of the candidates, this has to do with the appointments committee recommendation. And ordinarily, Penny, who is chair of appointments, would be presenting this one. But she uh, had to recuse herself because of uh, a family member being one of the applicants. So 
need to recuse yourself. I would like to yes. seen from voting regarding this okay. item. So. Okay. So do we have to vote to You usually that? look for a consensus, yes. Okay. Um, I'd like to move that we accept Penny, uh, Councillor Jordan recusing herself from this item. Second. I moved it second. Yeah, because of a conflict of interest relating to a family member applying for a position. Oh, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that, Mike. No, there's, <laughs> the, the council got called on the carpet after the last meeting because uh, okay. reasons weren't fully stated. So that was moved and seconded. I can't remember who seconded it, but I presume that's okay. Um, yeah. all, in, all in favor? Okay. And abstaining is one. Um, do you, Sarah, or do, do you want me to present this? I didn't print out my paperwork. Okay. I'll, I'll present it. Um, there is a recommendation uh, from the Appointments <laughs> Committee to fill uh, an unexpired term on the Planning Board. The term on the Planning Board is effective immediately and expires December 31st, 2012. The Appointments Committee, uh, made up of Sarah Lennon and Jessica Sullivan, and with me filling in for Penny Jordan, uh, interviewed some excellent candidates, six candidates, and uh, one withdrew because of a scheduling issue. Uh, but we would like to recommend that the Council appoint Carol Ann Jordan of 21 Wells Road to fill the unexpired term. Is there a second? I moved and seconded. Is there discussion? I'd just like to second your thanks for all the people who showed up to interview. They were all great candidates, and I would strongly encourage them and other people to apply again in the fall when there's a greater range of openings available. Um, it's always hard, very hard to choose, and it's always great to see people step up to these volunteer positions. So I guess a thank you from all of us on the committee. Absolutely. Any other comments? Okay. We'll move the question. All in favor? It's unanimous, 6-0. Any? Come back. Okay. Appropriation adjustments, item number 90. Michael? Yes, uh, thank you. Each uh, June, usually come to the council, uh, to look at all our individual departments and whether or not it looks like they'll be within the budget at the beginning of the year. Uh, when you appropriate the funds each year in May, you appropriate them to 37 separate departments. Uh, there's one that's now over budget, it appears that another one will be over budget, or could be over budget at the end of the year, uh, although it's, it's really close. Uh, the account that's over is for general assistance. This is for helping uh, citizens with basic needs such as housing, food, and utilities. We've spent about $27,532 of the, and only 12000 was allocated. Uh, the library, I think, is going to be okay, but it's really, really tight. Uh, so what I'd like to suggest is a $5,000 adjustment to the library budget. Uh, finally, the, the debt service, uh, when we refinanced the debt, we had to pay back the old debt or the debt that was refinanced. Uh, we took in more than enough money to pay it, but still, it shows that that account is overspent by about six million dollars, uh, which doesn't look which doesn't look good. Uh, oh well. Who does? Who does? He's go. It doesn't look good. So anyway, my recommendation is you authorize the adjusted department appropriations for the current fiscal year. Increase human services by twenty thousand from thirty-two. 484 to 5284, increase the library from 431,196 to 436,196, and increase to 5,000, increase debt service from 1,164,116 to 7 million, and then decrease public works from 1,013,144 to 988,144, and the decrease in public works, which we don't need because of various reasons, uh, more than pays for the increase in human services and uh, library. Uh, would like to mention that the debt change, actually we, we saved 85,000, so what well, looks like we're coming up with another six million. We're actually ahead, we're ahead on that. And overall, revenues are anticipated to exceed projected amounts by about 300,000, and expenditures will be at least 200,000 under the authorized level. So even though we're asking for 25,000 more 
in two areas uh, where to the good in expend net expenditures and revenues of about half a million dollars. Any questions for Mike? Jim? No, I'm also. Is it, is, Mike, is there a threshold where uh, a request for um, exceeding budget is required? Is it, is it yes, percentage? there is. One dollar. Just one dollar. Okay. <laughs> Can't and, exceed. And not to, uh, I, think, I think it's great that we work with the position to accommodate more social needs, but I'm curious as to how um, the, the approval process goes in terms of knowing that it's an exceed budget. How, how do you decide when we go ahead with it? It's a state law that you have to provide the needs if there's an unmet need of the person, so you, you, you have no choice uh, in, 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 with that particular account. You have, to, you have to meet the need under Maine state law. You can't say no to an applicant who's eligible. Yeah. When you look at the history of this account and what's taking place at the moment yeah. and sort of projecting in the next six months to a year, have we provided adequately for this funding in next year's budget? I don't know. We, we increased the budget from 6,000 two years ago to 12,000 for the current year to 25,000 for next year. So uh, if things stay relative the same this coming year as they were this past year, we'll be okay. But I, I cannot predict you know, unemployment. And, the, the, the macroeconomic issues that might affect individual citizens. Yeah, okay. But, 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 but the point is, we're planning, you know, the budget has increased from 6,000 to, to 24 or 5,000. Uh, More yeah. questions over here? Okay. Um, do we have a motion? So we just move the manager's recommendation. Mm -hmm. Is that simple? I move we accept. No, we have to accept it. Or approve, or whatever. The, the minutes will reflect the recommendation. You'll authorize the following. Yeah. Okay. So, was there a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, item number 91, Police Mutual Aid Agreement. Mike, you want to say anything about yes, that? Yes, the Chief of Police has been here for two and a half hours. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, one of the, the great things about living in a, in a community with good neighbors and with neighbors close by is that you can provide mutual aid to each other uh, from time to time. Uh, for a long time, we had a fire department mutual aid agreement to provide services within Greater Portland. And a few years back, the uh, police chiefs got together and worked with some uh, municipal attorneys and came up with a police mutual aid agreement. We, we actually do quite a bit in the way of mutual aid with the city of South Portland and South Portland with us uh, on at least a weekly basis. And uh, it's all provided for uh, through these interlocal agreements. Uh, Neil has been working with the other chiefs. Uh, he's been working with the attorneys. It's been checked out with our insurance company. Uh, uh, to make sure it's fully covered under our risk pool agreement, and it is. Uh, it's also been, we did not pay to have it reviewed by our municipal attorney, but most of our neighboring communities did. And so we saw no reason to, to hire uh, Monaghan Leahy to come out with the same opinion as, as Jensen Baird. Uh, it, uh, okay, thank you. Any questions for Mike? It's okay. There's an imbalance in how much we aid others versus us. Is there any reimbursement cost? There, no. Under mutual aid, you provide mutual aid. You know, if you, if you had one of these, you know, real disasters that you see happening, some of the, you know, like the, that sad thing in Oklahoma, excuse me, Arkansas, last few days, and you provide a lot of police mutual aid, you provide that aid. It's just you, you provide it whichever party's in need. Yeah. In the mutual aid agreement, are there um, other pieces of equipment that other towns have that we avail ourselves of here that we would otherwise have to purchase? You know, they bring police cruises to our, within the police, it's mainly just police cruises. We do have a, a separate agreement with Scarborough and South Portland uh, for a SWAT team. And the vehicle for that particular unit is, has been provided, I think, by grants over the years. But uh, that, you know, I don't think we would need our own SWAT van but we do have one provided through mutual aid should we need one. 
Any other questions for Mike? I'm sure. Oh, come, please come up front, Mr. Prince. You seem to be forgetting us a little bit. Pardon me? A couple of comments on this. Uh, overtime, section 4.2. Uh, no overtime uh, work shall be permitted. But if the department is fully staffed, and let's say we take three people out of the department to go to South Portland, then it seems to me the current staff has to work overtime in order to cover the job of the people who left to, to South Portland. That should be paid for by South Portland. Number two, uh, are we re reimbursed by the, and I'm not against this. Don't, don't, don't hear my comments as being negative at all. I just uh, look at this from a financial standpoint and say, wait a second, are we getting, are we getting, are we or are they getting hooked uh, on this thing at all? Uh, are we reimbursed for a salary and benefits, or just salary, or how, or how is that figured out? I don't know. It didn't say in here. On uh, 6.5, it said the responding municipality shall be responsible for all workers' compensation. The police officer goes out, gets shot, <clears throat> never goes back to work for the next 30 years. We're on the hook. It seems to me that they should all demand that the community that is asking for the responding officer, that officer during that time should be on that community's uh, workman's comp, not on our workman's comp. Why are we paying for that? These are high-risk jobs. I mean, th th these are not jobs where you're, you might be sending a plow truck out. Uh, these are police jobs that people could be firing guns, fire jobs. I, I suppose the fire department's in that, but that'd be a whole, a whole different thing. So I just wanted to mention those two things that I, I picked up when I read through this. That, I would want to have more clarification, frankly, have a little bit tighter control on it. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Prince. The manager can address yeah. some of your I think questions. I, can, I think I can address both. On, on the first issue of, of who pays and how is it paid and how is the calculation, there is no payment. It is strictly mutual aid, and if we provide service to South Portland, we do not pay, uh, they do not pay us. If they provide service to us, uh, we do not pay them. This, this, is, this is mutual aid. Uh, and you know you do look at it longer term to see if one community is advantaged over another. Uh, you know we we just haven't found uh, that. You know it, it all works. It seems to work out in the end. Uh, secondly, workers' comp. Uh, it it's it works under that same principle. You know it's just as likely that a South Portland officer coming to Cape was going to get injured here a, as it is the other way around. So you, you're covered by your your you the person paying your unemployment insurance uh, and your premium, which is the community that hires you. Thank you, Mike. Sarah? Uh, not to get into minutia, but actually I sort of disagree with the premise that it's just as likely somebody, <laughs> somebody coming into Cape Elizabeth would get hurt as going, if you just look at the, the crime log or statistics, it's actually a higher per chance that our police officers going to Portland or South Portland would get seriously injured. So maybe Mr. Prince has a point. Not, not really, because usually it's the community that responds first that is in the line of fire. They're up close. They're the ones that take, you know, I hate to comment upon this, they're the ones that take the hit before the help arrives. David. I also think we, that if we didn't have that agreement in place, you'd get into the dispute about, well, was the injury when Cape, officer went to South Portland was that a function of a pre-existing condition for which they already had an injury with the Cape workers comp insurance carrier or was it a significant aggravation and then it's that'd be if we made that change it'd be great work for a lot of lawyers uh, uh, forget so, it then <laughs> uh, that's a surefire way to defeat something if you say that but I think the, the goal here is to not have that sort of those subrogation claims going back and forth between communities yeah, and the goal is to have mutual aid, not to have, you know, so that people, forces can help each other, you know, it, so there is some sharing of risk. So, in any event, um, are, did we have a motion on this? I, I just wanted to thank tonight. Neil for all of his work on this. He, yes, thank he you, Neil. He worked considerable with the other chiefs. Well, he hasn't worked as hard as Deborah in the last month. He's been busy. And thank you for sitting here for so long, waiting for this. Could we have a motion, please? I move we accept the updated police mutual aid agreement presented this evening. Thank you. Is there a second? I second it. 
Are, are we moving to accept it, or do we actually have to approve it? To approve. approve. Okay. Can we just amend the motion to approve it? I get a lawyer in the party here. Well. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. The motion is to approve the agreement. And to, and to authorize the chief of police to sign it on behalf of the community. As he said, that's the motion. <laughs> that's the motion. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. The last item has to do with um, a request from the town of Herman to nominate their town, the town manager of uh, Herman. His name is Clint Deshan. Uh, for the Maine Municipal Association Vice President. It's really to put him on the nomination form and return it to MMA by July 2nd. I've worked with Mr. Deshan. I think he's a high quality candidate. Uh, I think he could do the job. And I think he's from a town, the town of Herman, which is a town, it's a suburb of Bangor. And his town has many of the same issues and concerns that Cape Elizabeth does um, in terms of it's not a service center, but it's not a small rural town either. So, so I would move that we um, put him on the nomination form. This doesn't mean we're voting for him for, for uh, VP. The, the vote comes later in the summer, but this is just to put him on the nomination form. I second I, the motion. Thank you. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, this is the second period where we have sit an opportunity for citizens to discuss. I'm sorry, to discuss items not on the agenda. Mr. Prince. Mr. Prince to Rocky Hill Road. In the last election, I was startled to find out that the state of Maine is between 700 million and one billion dollars in the hole. So what we went through last year is going to be a cakewalk compared to what's going to come up this next year. It was interesting because all the candidates were asked at one point or another, well, what are you going to do? And most of them just said, well, we'll do a study and try to determine where the, where the waste is and we'll get rid of it. And that answer was, we really don't have any idea. But knowing politics, as I think I know politics, when you need money, you go to those who are wealthy and you either take the money from them or you don't give them as much as they had experienced before. So I think the town of Cape Elizabeth is going to be hit with less money coming in from the state uh, because the state is going to try to help those towns that don't have as much. Now, I mention that because I am not the, fa uh, the, the brightest bulb in this room. And a few months ago, uh, Mike mentioned that he had a list of 120 uh, ideas on how you could cut expenses. And I went on the internet, and I'll be honest, we just couldn't find it. I'm sure it's there, but I just couldn't find it. And I would ask that uh, Mike get that back on the internet, or if you could email that to me, I'd be interested in it, because I think this is going to be a process we have to undertake every month. And I think every month, uh, you as a, uh, as a governing uh, uh, council of this town have got to be looking at expenses, because we are in deep trouble, nationally and statewide. Uh, I'd also like to suggest uh, uh, Jim Walsh post his 41 ideas on income re revenue ideas for the fort. The Cape Curry is one of the greatest things we have in this town. It's a real communications piece. If you want to know how to communicate with people, I don't know why you don't put these things in the Cape Curry and let people start talking about this and come in and start getting, uh, getting active. That's, that's your ticket. Rather than try, you trying to make a decision and then having people come back and saying, we don't like that decision, as you just did, Go out and get the ideas of the people and get them working for you as, as opposed to working against you. And lastly, I would remind you, 6,000 runners times $40 is $40,000. We have no problem. And that is half the cost of the Boston Marathon. And this is the premier race. Why we give it away is beyond me. And that's not this year. But all that takes is changing one number on that application from $35 to $75 and that is done. $240,000 in your pocket. So to say this is a problem which is not res uh, resolved is not just, it's just not right. It's not right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Prince. Uh, yes, Mike? Yeah, I'd like to 
just respond, uh, Mr. Prince, on the curtailment suggestions. If you go to the town's homepage and you go to budget 2000. I'm sorry, Mike, I didn't hear you. Yeah, if you uh, go to the town's homepage on the internet. Yeah, I've done go, that. And you go to the budget session. Budget session, section. I don't know Yeah, just budget. And then you, if you just scroll down, you'll see down there curtailment and a curtailment feedback. It's there. So just go to the budget link. It's on the left. And then scroll down to curtailment committee. And it's the first, uh, it's the first uh, what, what, what there. What committee was that, Mike? Curtailment committee. It's the first list. Curtailment feedback. From December 8th, 2009. Curtailment. Curtailment. Ah, Curtailment. It. Yeah, it's uh, still posted there along with a whole list of other suggestions that came up. And, and the other one that uh, Councilor Walsh mentioned, that was just prepared yesterday. Was that? It was just prepared yesterday. So That's why it wasn't in the quarry. Oh, I know, I know, I know. Yeah. No, no, I'm just trying and to the, say, I, I would get it out to the people. Yeah, and the Courier also is an independent newspaper. The town does not determine what they publish. Well, I understand that. Yeah. We just like to remind you I constantly of that. Probably the best newspaper we have, as far as I think, is from the uh, country. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah, your comments about getting citizen input are timely because we are considering that very issue of communication and how to be more effective and how to get people involved early on in the process. In fact, we have a workshop on it tomorrow night. So thank you. And my second comment is, if you love the Courier, for everybody out there, please send them a donation because they too are on hard times and I think I agree with you that it's one of the most important communication vehicles we have in this town and if we want it to continue they need they need some uh, they need some contributions send your check Jim and uh, mr. Prince you, a couple of your ideas are on that list of 41 by the way Oh, no, they are. Oh, I understand, but I'm sure there's other ideas. There's a ton of ideas. No, no, but, the, but you had a couple of ideas that were brought to us in public forum, and they are incorporated in the 41. The columbaria. Huh? The columbaria. That's Inter which, the internment location on yes. the park. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Prince. You. Okay. Uh, David? Just very briefly, too, along the lines of the Cape Courier, Mr. Prince, the town does not control the beach to beacon race. Yeah. And I keep hearing that idea that we should charge runners $40, but it, it, that is an independently run and organized race. So we would not have the power, I suppose, to impose that fee. Uh, and also, the, the beach to beacon doesn't cost the town anything, is my understanding. Uh, they cover all of the expenses that the town incurs. So yeah, what I could imagine happening is that it's sort of like people want to keep the park free. Every race in the country now, they'll start charging people 40 bucks to, for the privilege of running down their streets, and I, I just don't see that as a path we want to go down. But it'll be one idea of many that we explore. I, I just, I've heard that idea mentioned sem several times, and it's an independent race. So I just yes. want it to be clear there. Okay. Thank you. I will thank you very much, Mr. Prince. Before we uh, adjourn, I just want to remind people we have an upcoming workshop tomorrow night having to do uh, the, the things on the uh, agenda are communications strategies and policies and then just a review of um, an update of the comp plan, comprehensive plan. Then next, our next workshop after that is July 12th at 6 p.m. The councillors should note that that's right before our regular town council meeting which is at 7.30 p.m. on July 12th. And then our next council meeting after that is August 9th. So I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. And seconded. And seconded. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much, everybody.